Today's event is also brought to you by the Sylvia and David Steiner speaker, speaker Series, and Professor Angela Washko will introduce tonight's guest. Ahem, notes, 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 notes. Uh, thank you so much to the studio for partnering with us uh, in bringing the amazing Kim Yi and Young Jun Kwok into Carnegie Mellon. I could not be more excited to be introducing them tonight. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Angela Washko. I'm an associate professor in the School of Art. I teach classes in performance, experimental storytelling, video art, um, and art and activism, among other things. I also co-organize a performance project called Failsafe here in town with Scott Andrew and Jesse Stiles. Um, if you're not familiar, Failsafe exists to create platforms for new performance works across disciplines and to foster support for experimental, in progress, complicated, messy, and hard to explain performance work. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of a plug to that in a moment, but um, I was first introduced to our visiting artists through Mutant Salon in Los Angeles, which Young June over here describes as a beauty salon and roving platform for collaborative performance and community building that strives to foster connections between queer, trans, people of color, women, and mutant communities to celebrate an ethos of transformation and critical togetherness in the act of self-care. Um, I saw a mutant salon presented right around the time that we started Failsafe, and I was deeply inspired and wanted to bring artists working in this way to Pittsburgh and connect them with local performance artists here. Uh, so we did that. <laughs> we reached out, we got an NEA grant to support it, um, collaborated with a bunch of institutions here in town, and so here we are. <laughs> Thanks for being a part of it. A uh, quick plug for Failsafe. If you haven't already been spammed to death by all of our emails, um, it's happening this Friday and Saturday evening at the Kelly Strayhorn Theater in town. Um, if you don't already have your tickets, please go to the KST website. Uh, this new edition, we will be able to bring Yeon Jun Kwok, Kim Yi, and also Marvin Astorga. Where are you, Marvin? Where's Marvin? Oh, Marvin! Woo, Marvin! <laughs> from Los Angeles uh, to perform in the program uh, in dialogue with a lineup of brilliant local performance artists, dancers, cam performers, uh, musicians, media designers, and more, uh, making work about the body, self-actualization, power dynamics, uh, and identity. Okay, on to the formal intro uh, so that I can stop talking and you can hear from them. Uh, Young Jun Kwok is a Los Angeles-based multidisciplinary artist who primarily uses sculpture, performance, video, and community-based collaborations to reimagine new and continually evolving bodies, selves, and futures. Kwok received an MFA from the University of Southern California in 2014, an MA in Humanities from the University of Chicago, and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. They're the founder of Mutant Salon and lead performer in the electronic dance noise band Zeno Zerner, who you can see on Saturday, woo! And <laughs> yes, thank you for joining me in the woos. <laughs> Kim Yi is a Los Angeles-based interdisciplinary artist whose work incorporates performance, video, sculpture, installation, and text. She received her MFA from UCLA and her BA from Pomona College. Uh, influenced by language and the aesthetics of BDSM, drag, and other avenues for self-actualization, her work explores the inversion of power dynamics through creating situations of exchange and intimacy. She's performed and exhibited nationally and internationally at the Hammer Museum, Getty Center, uh, BAM Center, and many other very significant venues. Please join me in welcoming our amazing guests, Kim Yi and Young Jun Kwok. Woo! Hi, <laughs> I'm Young June. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. And let's see if this. Oh, um, so how we're gonna do things tonight is that I'll show you some of my work, and then Kim will show you some of her work, and then we'll talk about our collaborative work. Okay. Um, I see our bodies as sites of radical contradiction, how a body presents itself, how it's read, belying its true lived yet unperceived nature. And I use sculpture and performance and video and collaborations with my community to um, pose different ways of 
uh, understanding our bodies like beyond the skin, um, from static and bound um, to an expanded sense of bodies as complex, open-ended, always transforming. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, my sculpture work, but uh, before then, I also wanted to talk about um, my history in like performing uh, in queer nightlife and with my band Zena Zerner uh, with Marvin Astorga. Um, which informs and influences my work in several ways. I feel like drag performance taught me to own that the self, our subjectivities are always a performance. It taught me about the organizing function of materials to connote meaning and identity. And this allowed me to think of how material fragments could be manipulated in different ways to reimagine what a body could be, what it could look like, how it could function and how it could signify different things. Like an assemblage, a multiplist vision of how bodies are materialized and by fragments that are contingent on each other. One can imagine um, well, one can imagine the affects flowing in the spaces in between the seams of these fragments and the potential for transformation between these different material fragments. And I'm interested in how these in-between spaces call attention to um, the spaces in ourselves that like elude um, our bodily senses. Um, as Zena Zerner, I use a vocal transformer to continually change my voice, shifting my pitch from little girl to like deep voiced man to monster and cyborg, devolving into layers of unintelligible noise. And um, I was thinking about how to achieve like a, a sort of trans voice in which another mode of presenting my body as I want it to be seen, as continually transforming. The connections that I make on the dance floor and the communities that are created in nightlife are so inspirational for me in, in all of my work. Um, they become not only my friends and my models for my cast sculptures, they appear in, in um, my work, my collaborators in different performances and installation projects, um, including Mutant Salon. But, um, Dancing and interacting with audience members is like a crucial part of our performances uh, from which I learn so much. Um, I try to create an intimate and vulnerable confrontation between my body and the bodies of audience members where we're able to connect across boundaries of difference through dance, moving, jumping, screaming, uh, where we're able to glimpse not only like the otherness in, in, our, um, in each other <laughs> and ourselves. This sort of performative reciprocal interaction in which like I learn from audience members and not the other way around really kind of inspires a lot of the, um, and it influences my approach to the other activities in my art practice. Um, this is, uh, a sculpture called Divine Popo, which means kiss in, um, in Korean. And it's a cast sculpture that I made of two young Korean queer women uh, kissing, um, shown in my recent show at Arco Art Center in South Korea. Um, and this is exemplary of a casting process that I call reverse casting to create these like skins. Uh, rather than creating a replica of the statue of, of a statue or or of these models um, by using the mold as a negative vessel to create uh, the positive art object, this like reverse casting method that I use like presents the negative form rather than the positive traditional cast. Unlike traditional sculptures of la large mass and volume, th these are light and delicate. They show the impression of a bygone thing like like trace fossils, and I, I want to suggest like, like trace fossils, like I want to suggest the, uh, an infinite number of possible truths um, and unknown potential of these bodies through their absence. And it also, just to show you the concave surfaces, it has an odd sense of dimensionality as you continue to move around it. 
I don't want it to be static and unchanging, but I want it to be active and transforming. Um, the other side of the sculpture extends this sort of uh, um, sense of potentiality through holographic rhinestones that draw you near to it um, like shimmering water, but it's elusive because its form and color shift with each slight movement. Um, it has an open-ended relationship to form and color and light and it, depending on the positionality of the viewer. And I want to, to draw our gaze toward the edges of our perception to suggest the limitations and all that exists outside of our perception of bodies. I also use the cast to create this print so that their bodies deviate further from their original form. I think about how an eph ephemeral trace, a shadow, a landmark reveals the fleetingness, vulnerability, and fragility of our bodies. I want to convey a sense of being a ghost or never having fully arrived. We may discover something about ourselves and our bodies by seeing them as not yet fully formed. I think of these as sort of an abstract topography of bodily potential. Bodies that are still transforming, that are still being invented, that have yet to fully emerge but are imminent. This is an installation view of like the uh, front of um, the start of my exhibition, uh, All About Love at Arco Art Center in Korea. So at, at the front of the exhibition was a suite of works from a few years back from another exhibition of mine titled Her Me or Her My, um, inspired by both Herma statues and the deity Hermaphroditus, which was uh, greeting viewers. Um, so in the front of the exhibition, I had this like Herma statue of mine. Um, and for those of you who don't know, like Herma statues are square columns bearing only the gods, uh, the heads of gods and genitals as figurative markers of masculine power and authority that were placed in front of the properties of people in positions of power to mark one's territory, to claim space. And I wanted to subvert the original function of Herma statues claim the space as one of healing and protection for non-normative genders and bodies. Um, I was also drawn to like uh, Hermes statues after a public conversation that I did um, at another school with another like queer artist who makes minimal work and um, I, uh, that denies any like signifiers of queerness in their visual work and I became self-conscious of how I was being positioned as like the messy queer maximalist and you know that makes ugly queer pussy dicks and for me it was a question of like of passing and um, you know there are trans people who can pass as a gender or their ge actual gender and those that cannot, often based on race, class, and access to resources. And this made me think of how minimalists had announced that the content is the form from a so-called objective viewpoint. But it made us understand that the height of modernist conceit, the universal, isn't universal at all in that it represents and reproduces power relations that bolster boundaries of race, class, and biological essentialism. I was interested in how Herma statues joined figuration and minimalist abstraction. I was interested in a queer formalism that doesn't see itself as one side of a binary, but rather locates itself within a genealogy of sculpture and expands on this discourse without having to deny queer subjectivity, to carve out new spaces that uplift and center marginalized bodies, communities, and to make space for queerness and non-normativity. At the time, I made works inspired by Hermaphroditus, and I was, um, as well, and uh, <laughs> I was interested in looking back at art history in order to see and make sense of where we were at the, you know, um, present day conflict around, and confusion around classifying trans and non-normative bodies, and I thought about legislation going on at the time, and, you know, and currently such as, like, transgender bathroom bills that, like, the American government was using to further police our bodies based on what one's genitals look like. Um, and then I thought back to this early memory of encountering the statue of Hermaphroditus at the Louvre when I was just a young kid visiting France for the first time. And 
I just remember so clearly seeing the statue from a distance and being struck by its like, you know, from this angle with its gentle curvature and then rounding the corner and discovering oh, the breasts and a penis. And in Greek myth, like Hermaphroditus was meant to synthesize the ideals of the masculine and the feminine. And you think about all the infinite ways by which the masculine and the feminine, the subtle nuances of how that could be represented. But most often it was reduced to like a female form with a penis. Um, with like breasts and a penis. And I created a fiberglass cast of my friend Alice in the same pose, but reoriented so that the expectation to reveal one's identity is replaced with a position of active defiance. That's me looking at you. <laughs> this is another statue of Hermaphroditus at the Louvre from ancient Greece. Um, and hermaphroditus is often, in a lot of artwork and statues, is oftentimes represented via the lifting of the fabric of their garment for the salacious reveal of their genitalia. And the reification of this gesture throughout Western art history proliferates the conflation of, you know, uh, trans, intersex, cross-dresser, gender non-conforming, whatever. Um, representations in the present day. And looking back at this statue, I was thinking about its age materiality. I, I know that, now I know that they were originally painted, but the colors having faded over time so that, that the carved fabric and the skin and the genitalia are all of the same stone body. And um, this served as the inspiration for the fabric and body works in my Hermaphroditus's reveal ser series. And so here there are no stolen glances, no simple categorizations. The fabric reveals negative space and the relationship between the space, fabric, and bodies is of indeterminate materiality, inconclusive discovery. I want to refuse spectacular rev revelation and invite complex engagement. Here, hands redirect and obscure as much as they reveal placing the power of exposure into their own hands. Multiple layers of fabric and of concealing and revealing. And I, w I want this piece to gesture toward the many subtle nuances of a body that contains hidden multitudes. This is another sculpture of a cast that includes a cast of a, um, queer trans uh, POC friends of mine to create this amorphous circle dance where we're all holding each other in a um, sort of continuous cycle of support and intimacy. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I want their, uh, yeah, just think about it as like a kind of collective body conjuring a portal or something of some sorts. And just thinking about like uh, choreography, how a gesture or, or a bodily trace could lead us elsewhere um, to thinking of new bodies and futures. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about Mutant Salon. So I moved to LA in 2012 and began, um, I moved to LA in 2012 for grad school and uh, um, began playing Zena Zerner shows around town and we found such a strong supportive community of like queer, trans, and POC and um, audience members and other performers. And I would witness performances at these so-called like non-art venues that blew my mind and made me wonder why isn't this in an art gallery? At the same time, I needed to make my studio into something of a dressing room because I didn't feel safe to get dressed and made up in my apartment in my neighborhood. So I created Mutant Salon. Um, I had the privilege of having the space and platform that comes with institutional backing, and I wanted to extend this safe space with my community to collaborate with them. Um, and in the past, mutant salons have invited the general public to like these extravaganzas in which we'd uh, collaborate on creating immersive installations that incorporate artwork in different mediums, including sculpture, video, and performances, live music with bands and DJs, and poetry readings, like um, uh, community library, and different forms of like audience participation, like kind of uh, the space being like a mix of beauty salon, nightclub, gallery, and activity space. And 
you know, where we'd offer audience members like free makeovers, uh, um, including like haircuts and nails, uh, um, makeup, body work, psychic readings. Um, it's, it's, it's since become more of like a roving free form platform um, for uh, collaborative installations and performances. Um, yeah, and in Mutant Salon, uh, we use a multiplicity of mediums, frames, spaces, and physical um, and ideological elements to um, stage an encounter with uh, a sort of anti-normative, disruptive, wanting to imagine a different world kind of queerness. Um, you know, we're united by our desire to imagine different bodies and worlds and futures that counteract the violent and um, harmful and dehumanizing effects of the objectification, surveillance, and policing of our bodies. Um, I think of Mutant Salon as a sort of like queer time and space in which the objectification script is flipped through what Gordon Hall calls reparative objectification, in which we mutually objectify each other in ways that allow us to recuperate our historically pained relationship to being objectified. In Mutant Salon, we relearn how to see each other as objects of profound beauty. We could show our bodies without shame and feel valued and respected for who we are. Though our bodies may be covered in trash and look monstrous, they're still beautiful because we make each other beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be, let's. I actually just want to start with these photos. I did not take these photos, but these are my parents, and they were taken actually in Pittsburgh in 1988. Um, this is where they landed when they first immigrated from China. So, you know, Pittsburgh was America for them. Um, and since, you know, Young and I's work together kind of respond to where we are and like our immediate surroundings, I just wanted to kind of honor this trajectory that, um, you know, kind of has me looping back to this place. Uh, when I texted my mom for some photos um, about Pittsburgh, just telling her that I was gonna be here, she sent me this WeChat. Um, that's the image on the, what is that, the left? Yeah, so that's like a small image of her studying with like all these like papers on the ground and then the caption, study hard for a better future. Um, on the right is an image of her in, you know, mall. Um, so I'm kind of sitting with this idea of democracy the day after the election and thinking about, you know, America and its intertwinement with capitalism and the construction of this like neoliberal subject, right? Like the mythology that through like hard work, self-determination, you know, you can reach your dreams or some kind of like actualized state that transcends personal, historical, geographic limitations placed on your body. And so, yeah, I don't know, is this place familiar to people? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, the aspiration, like I'm really interested in like this, this aspirational thrust that we as individuals hold and the different strategies we implement in an attempt to, you know, get where we think we want to go. Um, the way that we produce like gestures and images through our bodies that give form to the values and ideolo ideologies that kind of like circulate nebulously around us. Um, so I'll kind of go into images of my own work now. Um, yeah, so one of the things I feel like I keep coming back to is this, you know, the expression of power as a force that produces relationships between bodies and how it orients us towards and away from one another within different communities. Um, you know, each community kind of has their own codes, their own aesthetic, their own practices. And so, you know, I want to be specific with the ones I'm engaging in. Um, I take kind of an auto-ethnographic approach, so I reflect, address, and engage with the groups that I myself identify with and kind of come from. So a lot of times this means I'm talking to artists, 
um, and holding up our practices and our anxieties especially to uh, that of other communities trying to propose like parallels and opportunities for like exchange and to learn from one another. So these images are from a performance called Art Scene, which I made in collaboration with Christine Wang, who is another LA-based artist, or now she's in San Francisco. Uh, but in this performance, which we made in LA, Christine on the left plays, uh, role plays as a gallery owner, while I take on the role of the young artist, like literally groveling for an opportunity to show at her gallery, please. Um, <laughs> The strategies I engage with are in conversation with frameworks that come out of the BDSM community, wherein participants play with interpersonal power dynamics as a material, as something to um, mold and that creates structure, right, around like uh, the interaction. So I don't, I'm always unsure of like how familiar people are with, uh, you know, what I mean when I say BDSM. So I'll just say a few words about it as it pertains to um, this piece and kind of like my practice. So BDSM incorporates a whole bunch of different activities. Some are erotic, others are totally mundane. Um, think chores, cleaning, things like that, boot blacking, um, that involve consensual power exchange. So if there are, let's say, two people taking part in a BDSM scene, one would typically take on the role of the dominant uh, or the top, and then the other would take on the role of the submissive or the bottom. And through this process of ex explicit negotiation that happens before the beginning of the scene, the parties involved would lay out the boundaries and limits of their interaction. Um, with the submissive party always having the ability to withdraw consent at any time using, you know, uh, a safe word or a code of some sort. And that would signal kind of like a timeout. So to give you an idea of how that might sound, um, this is from the beginning of Christine and my performance. And it's going to be mostly audio as it just fades into like a few seconds of the performance. So it's about one minute long. Hi, is this uh, Mistress Lucy? Mistress Lucy Khan? Yes, this is she. With whom am I speaking? Uh, well, um, my name is Christine, and I saw your ad on the internet. And I wanted to inquire about booking a session with you. Okay, fabulous. Why don't you tell me a bit about yourself, your BDSM interests, and what you're hoping to experience with me? Well, uh, I'm an artist, so I'm really into humiliation and submission. Um, I guess I'm contacting you because I would want to see what it would be like if you were my gallerist. Um, I also like to beg and suck cock. Okay, well, I love role-play scenarios, so it sounds like we could have a nice time together. As long as you have an MFA from Yale or Columbia, I think we can set something up. Um, um, is, is UCLA okay? I, I work with Andrea Frazier. Hmm. <laughs> and then it begins. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you can kind of hear, uh, you know, the expression of interest, the limits, things like that, and also kind of giving voice to the anxieties that might be specific to uh, art students, young artists, artists in general, you know, the pedigree, what counts as currency, things like that. Um, you know, I think this, like, explicit identification and negotiation of one's, like, agency within a scene like this um, really subverts normalized hierarchies that depend on its like in implicitness, taken for grantedness, and like unspokenness. Um, so I see, you know, kind of uh, this act as like an act of resistance against hierarchical power structures as it exists, even as it like enacts and embodies uh, those structures. So as the performance unfolds, uh, the artist, you can see, agrees to do menial labor, like patching and painting walls with the hope of winning the gallery owner's attention. The artist accepts corporal punishment for messing up, doing a not thorough enough job. And eventually uh, submits to being 
penetrated by the gallerist while eating ramen from a dog bowl. I mean, it looks pretty rough. Um, but at the end, you see the artist and the gallerist kind of hug. The gallerist asking the artist, you know, oh, how was that for you? Is everything okay? And the artist's like, oh, that was wonderful. You fulfilled all my fantasies. I'll, I'll definitely call you back for another session. So this idea of taking, uh, you know, kind of a subjugated position and turning it into a fantasy and having control over a situation in that way. Um, so I continue to expand on the possibilities that exist between frameworks of BDSM and the practice of art in my sportswoman show, where I created an installation uh, inspired by a gymnasium. I used materials like latex and canvas, vinyls, zippers, astroturf, to replicate elements that are usually hard and structural in a pliant and flaccid manner. And yeah, let me show another image of that. So by putting kind of like, uh, you know, BDSM, sports, art in conversation with one another through these materials, I was trying to propose that uh, softness, flexibility, and actually surrender are under-recognized and underutilized forms of, uh, of power in our society. Uh, which obviously stand in contrast to the kind of like hardcore language we use around will and dominance uh, that is really prevalent in our culture, you know, and how we express mastery um, and success. Um, so some things I'm thinking about in this project include, you know, how do individual agents who occupy different positions in a field like art, how do we vie for comp competitive advantage or leverage? And also, how can the artist-viewer relationship be activated to propose um, alternatives or alter, alterations to mainstream images or populist ideologies around what dominance and powers look like? Um, is there a way to make like kind of a new aesthetics? So inside this installation, I hosted hour-long performances every Sunday that blended the formal elements of the artist talk, uh, PE class, and a BDSM scene. Um, you see me there on the left, and then my poor participants on the right. And between our legs, we have balloons that have been inflated by our breath, which kind of represented our egos leaving our bodies um, through this kind of like ongoing workout rhetoric that I would spew throughout the class. Um, other activities included uh, requiring the participants to clean the art pieces uh, on their hands and knees, scrubbing away the dirt that they had all collectively put there. Um, kind of a metaphor for taking responsibility for their own personal garbage um, or baggage that they brought into this space. And this is kind of just a smattering of the materials and props that were used for physical challenges and corrections. Um, some are traditionally used in BDSM scenes and um, you the orange piece of paper there is actually a waiver that I required people to sign um, using uh, like markering their lips and their thumbprints and kind of like physically bowing to sign it with their body. Um, in the waiver, participants were let, uh, were informed that they could use their safe word and could yell, I am a soft spineless scrotum at any point to opt out of activities that were beyond their heart limits. <laughs> I think only one person ever shouted that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think what might be, you know, what kind of was like the thesis of the performance um, was proposing that only by facing and accepting our own mental and emotional garbage can one truly harness the nuclear power of our, one's own internal landfill and trauma, uh, using it as power to achieve one's aspirations. Uh, one interesting social dynamic that came out of these series of performances was that um, the people who participated in it uh, repeatedly 
uh, expressed to me this like strong sense of camaraderie between themselves and the other participants. Um, and like this feeling of bonding through this like self-selected vulnerable making situation. And okay, and that, this is gonna be like the last piece that I talk about before we talk about our joint work. So I guess I'm thinking in this one, um, it's, it, I'm thinking about the power of surrender and role and its role in transcendence. Um, this piece is called Shared Value and it begins with an open letter that uh, was distributed through an artist run gallery and also through my own personal mailing list. Uh, I was gonna read it, but it looks really small. Can you all read it? Okay. Should I read it? Okay, I'll say. Dear artist, money is slippery. It can be everything without being anything. It seeps into your life and dissipates into a smattering of goods, vanishing without any record of where it came from or went. It is decidedly nonspecific. Your work is specific, valuable in a way that is unique and inseparable from its material state. Every mark and index of a choice you once made, a motion you executed with your body. You trade your work for money, but would you trade it for something as specific as your work? Perhaps an experience created and curated just for you, one that lives inside you going forward? Ask yourself, what kind of experience would you want to have in order to part with your work? It could be as explicit and as expansive as the art you create. Studied but spontaneous, complex but generous, mysterious and hiding in plain sight. This experience, like your work, could give you freedom within a structure, lovingly coercing those who slide down its rabbit hole into a space of playful disorientation and discovery. From the vanilla to the extreme, I propose a trade that is somewhat unorthodox. I propose to trade your creativity, your energy, your expression for mine. Exchange a piece of your work for an experience in fantasy fulfillment with a seasoned professional role player. The tone of your scene can be friendly, seductive, aloof, and or nasty. The choice is up to you. This is simply an invitation to discuss further the possibilities that exist between us as artists seeking different forms of exchange outside capitalist systems. Can we find shared value through uncommon currencies? And then basically it gives an instruction about how to get in contact with me. Uh, and then we, d we people who reached out, I'd follow up and we'd like negotiate via email uh, about the specifics. So um, yeah, I've, I've worked as a professional dominatrix for the past 10 years. And through this process, I met a lot of artists and whose work has been um, funded by erotic labor, you know, not just now, but also throughout history. And so I began to think about like how capital and value circulates um, within the art community and the things that we depend on in order to create our work. Um, you know, in doing the labor I was doing, I was kind of extracting value from an outside source and then kind of like circulating it within uh, you know, my art community. And I thought that this could be kind of like an experiment and are we able to circulate that energy ourselves? Um, so the people that ended up responding, uh, what happened with their work was that I displayed it in the gallery. So it ended up being, I don't know, kind of like a curatorial project in some way. Um, the actual exchanges themselves were not documented unless they were like a public uh, happening or event requested by the participant. Um, so for example, one person who wanted to do like a collaborative performance or event was the artist Lob. And this is documentation from the opening of Shared Value um, where he requested that I perform a ritual uh, where I cut off his clothes, shaved his head, and uh, restrained him, and administered tickle torture in a, a kind of like endurance uh, challenge throughout the course of the night. And as the exchanges happened, 
uh, their names were etched on the wall of the gallery. And all in all, there were 24 artists who participated. And, you know, many collaborations <laughs> developed from this project, and some are still continuing to happen. And you might see a familiar name on there under number 14, which actually resulted in um, the per first performance Young and I ever did together um, as a result of this project. Do you want to come up? Yeah. Let's do it together. Okay. You could talk about it. I mean, um, basically, so, uh, yeah, Kim asked me to participate in this thing, and um, I was like, well, fantasy nightmare, like, <laughs> I, um, okay, and I um, traded a work of mine for, um, I wanted Kim to uh, take me to, through the rights of becoming a real woman, um, through a public performance at the Hammer Museum. <laughs> um, and yeah, that was, that was. An Should I show some documentation sure. from that event? So this is a smattering of kind of like different moments throughout that event where uh, I, I w took on the role of mommy and uh, you know, basically kind of took baby girl through the rights of womanhood, which included kind of fat shaming, um, <laughs> learning how to put on makeup, kind of beauty rituals, um, you know, kind of giving voice to all these really toxic tropes that one might encounter in a, in a woman's body moving through society. Um, and I think it was someone described it as like a mommy dearest style uh, mm -hmm. performance. There's moments where uh, Young was bound or handcuffed to the rail of the hammer. Um, we also brought her outside and paraded her and objectified her around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Anything to add to that? Well, also, I... Um yeah, I saw this as a, an opportunity, like I kind of traded a work of mine for a collaboration in a way, because I had been a fan of Kim's since I had like come to LA. I told you, you were like the first perform, your performance was like the first art experience that I had in LA, really oh, like God. seeing you perform at an art gallery. And I was just like, it felt like a manifesting moment. Yeah, and it's funny because I also feel the same about Mutant Salon when oh I saw y'all at Co Commonwealth and Council. So I feel like it was like a, yeah, just creating of an opportunity. Um, so this was some of the photo documentation from the hammer, but then later we mixed the footage from the hammer with um, kind of studio recorded slow motion uh, sequences, basically. Yeah. We, um, through performing, uh, going through this performance, there were just these moments that seemed really significant and like meaningful for us that we just like wanted to extend and kind of like slow down time. And um, we wanted to create this video that mac like mixes performance documentation footage along with these like dreamlike sequences that were shot in a studio. Um, yeah, I think one of the like common issues with performance work is that it's so difficult to kind of catch the feeling of being there in your the moment in your body between bodies, you know, in the air and then showing just like what happened um, is often just like such a downer compared to what it was. And so I think this was like a strategy uh, one way that we tried to like really make it its own standalone piece. Um, and we can maybe share some of that piece. Yeah. And then on the other hand, I was thinking just like how in performances, a lot of these like moments that are super significant and for, for us or that um, go often, often go out missed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like another way by which it's like, you know, we, it, it just seemed really appropriate to like kind of uh, create this video um, 
yeah, like it, allowing for these like extended moments of mm -hmm. contemplation around these like, you know, moments of like, you know, tenderness and intimacy that like are also really like subtle and we can literally like direct the gaze mm -hmm. toward that. Yeah, and then we mixed the audio from the actual performance with uh, Mar uh, Martin's score. Marvin. Marvin's score, oh my God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Marvin. I know who you are. You know I do. Okay. Hello. This unfair place. You can't be a fucking baby forever. Can you? How you learn to be a oh, yeah. That's right, get used to it. Isn't this what you wanted, little baby? To grow up? I mean, it's a fabulous woman.
be embarrassed. This is completely natural. This is the last project. Um, well, it's not the last one that we're showing, but uh, I mean, that we've done, but um, the last one that we're going to share with you today. So, oh, yeah, we're, so this is uh, um, a three channel video uh, film installation that we did in Banff um, uh, for a show that we did at the Walter Phillips Gallery and at the BAMF Center. Um, and we wanted to create something like specific to the site of BAMF, but um, trying to think of ways to do so while addressing, like there's such a long legacy of artists responding to the site and the curator was so instrumental in like kind of introducing us to all that is like taking place in relation to the site. And we wanted to be sensitive to this place that we were having an institutional exhibition in as foreigners and like, outsiders and um, it seemed like the most sincere way to do so was to embrace our like ourselves as like tourists and then um, you know and so we thought about like doing this project of like mommy and baby go on vacation to Banff um, which is a lot like a popular resort town for a lot of like uh, yeah foreign populations so yeah, we saw a lot of uh, Asian tourists as we were going mm -hmm. through downtown Banff, and there were a few like kind of like Asian markets, and um, we ourselves felt very much like, uh, you know, uh, kind of I don't know, I Lumped like aligned, <laughs> you know, in some way, yeah. and so I think when we are collaborating or like invited somewhere to go, like we always like kind of respond to mm -hmm. the site or like what's happening in that moment in time. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of like our way of like talking or like creating something from like a place where we felt like authorized to to speak from and represent as well. Yeah, and I guess that also there was just like particularly a really long legacy of like queer artists and and um, queer and indigenous and uh, POC artists that like such as um, Adrian Stimson, um, an indigenous artist that created a piece where he created a video walk through downtown Banff um, as his like campy indigenous drag alter ego Buffalo Boy. 
And then there's also uh, Lori Million and Shauna Dempsey's Lesbian Park Rangers piece that provided inspiration for us. And in the exhibition, uh, they actually allowed us to um, exhibit their videos alongside um, our work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to set up the video, like uh, the, the center channel, um, I don't know, it kind of like references, I guess, like Adrian Stimson's walk through downtown. Um, I'll just play it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I guess each of the channels were different lengths, and so it was like a variable loop. And um, also just wanted to mention that the score was composed by Marvin Astorga as well mm -hmm. on that video. Um, I think that's it, right? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thank you.